Finding by Losing, the title of our meditation on our scriptures for this, the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. I was uh, visiting with Jenny, a young mother in our congregation, on Monday of this week. And this was, of course, the first day for students to return to either um, in-person or virtual instruction from home with their parents standing by. And Jenny told of texting a good friend of hers later that day who wrote, well, we made it through the first day of school and I only cried once. <laughs> you know, I think this mother kind of summed it up for all of us. Watching the news has been hard enough, let alone listen, listening to the pre-election pund punditry and coping with new ways of learning technology and trying to figure out how to connect with one another. By the time we get to the end of the week, we could use some good news. So it is we come to Sunday. We set aside time to worship, to simply sit in some quiet space made holy by God's presence. We set aside this time to come near. And what I love more than anything about worship is that it gives us time to hear once again, ancient stories of people who had holy encounters with the living God. As people of faith, we come each Sunday, week after week, longing for our own holy encounter. And together in faith, we ponder what it is that God is up to in our lives today, now in this most amazing time in which we are living. Well, last week we heard how Peter, in a shining moment of discipleship history, um, confessed his belief in Jesus' true identity as Messiah, Savior. And upon Peter's bold confession, we learned our Lord will build his church. And this week we get to hear the second part of the story. We learn that minutes later, Peter reacts to Jesus' further explanations with total incredulous shock and disbelief, and as a result, suffering a blistering rebuke from the Lord he loves. you got to love Peter. I don't know about you, but I am so grateful to hear a story about a disciple who can have it all together one minute, only to lose it the next. Because, <laughs> you know, this is my reality. Yours too? Well, thank goodness Jesus didn't give up on Peter. May we also trust that our Lord won't give up on us. Right now, it feels hard to cope with life. And sometimes it can be hard to keep the faith. It's not easy to understand when Jesus tells us that we find our lives by first losing them or letting go of them. And yet this is exactly what he did, loving us all the way to the cross, into death and out of the tomb, into resurrection life. This is the spiritual path that he invites us to take over and over in our lives, the path of suffering and joy, of brokenness and redemption that leads us into the very heart of our God. Our stories today are filled with strange sights and strange sayings. Our Old Testament story tells us that Moses headed into a place beyond the wilderness. And the original hearers of this story would have picked up on this right away. The wilderness is a place of desolation and danger. So to go beyond the wilderness is to head into a place of even deeper mystery. Moses is stopped in his tracks by the sight of a bush that burns and yet is never consumed by a voice of a God whose name is pure being. I am who I am, or I am the one who causes things to pass. This is a God who is compassionate, 
who is present, who has and continues to hear the voice of his people who cry out, who are suffering, who are enslaved, who are tortured and dying. And God calls Moses to the task of going to get them and bring them out. And Moses had tried this once. Remember how he tried rescuing a slave and ended up murdering the man's abuser? While he'd been raised by Pharaoh's daughter, he never lost sight of his ethnic heritage. And ever since he's been running from the law, this former prince of Egypt working as a shepherd for his father-in-law. It's as if God said to him, Moses, I have a job for you. I want you to come out of the witness protection program and run for public office. What? What, thinks Moses? Can you, can you imagine receiving a call for a task for which you don't feel gifted or qualified, especially when your entire vocational career has been dedicated to staying out of the spotlight and keeping a low profile? But God has a way of doing impossible, surprising things with our lives, with our dreams, with our circumstances, with our church. <laughs> even at the end of another week like ours, if only we will let him. Moses, you're it, says God. Let's get going, and don't worry, I'll be with you every step of the way. Have you ever noticed how the journey of faith has a way of taking us in the opposite direction in order to get us just to the right place? And just as Moses was called by God, so too are we, beginning with our baptism. Baptism is an adventure into the abundant life that Jesus came to give to us. And the only thing worse than living into your baptismal calling would be to live a life without a calling. The most amazing thing about the gift of free will that God has given to us is that we can choose either to live not responding to God, or to live, really live by answering God's call, using the gifts that God has given to us, trusting that God is present with us every moment for the living of our days in every circumstance. We see the disciples trying to make sense of what feels like moving in the opposite direction as Jesus talks about how God will transform human hearts. Peter has his revelation. The disciples have all realized that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah, the one who, like Moses, will free his people. So his people living under occupation, their next move would have been to sit down and plan their strategy. If Jesus is the new king, then they need to figure out how to get rid of the present people in power, King Herod and the priests of Israel. And the obvious solution would be to march on Jerusalem and pick up supporters on the way, choose your moment, say your prayers, fight a surprise battle, take charge of the temple and install Jesus as the new king, because that's how people get things done in this world but not our God. Jesus came to show us how God sees things. And for us who are used to living in a broken world that takes something as paradoxical as a cross of execution to help us see as God sees. A cross where death and resurrection meet. A cross where Jesus enters human life to meet us, a cross that breaks open our hearts and our minds to see ourselves and our world with holy vision. Peter has a holy epiphany. He gets it. He sees and he understands before the rest of the disciples that Jesus is the one they've been waiting for, the promised Messiah. You know what it feels like when you recognize and you get to participate in a truth or a noble cause that's bigger than yourself? It's, it's like the feeling of saying, I love you for the first time. Saying it to the one who returns your risk-taking by loving you in return. That's what happens for Peter. 
just outside Caesarea Philippi, this, this confession tumbling from his heart, brimming over with insight, his heart begins to tremble with overwhelming joy. And then moments later, his heart begins to break. Can you, can you hear it shatter? It fractures when Jesus sternly orders all of them not to tell anyone he's the Messiah. And then Jesus explains that he would have to go to Jerusalem to suffer at the hands of religious leaders. And there's the next jagged break. And his suffering would lead to being killed. And with this final fracture, Peter is completely heartbroken. So much so you wonder if he can't hear the last thing Jesus says, that he will suffer, be killed, and on the third day be raised. In this passage, we hear the sound of a human heart breaking. No wonder Peter protests. He loves his Lord. This sounds crazy, even blasphemous. The Messiah suffer, die? Peter expects the Messiah to be a powerful deliverer to remove the Israelites from oppression like Moses delivered them from Egypt to restore the glorious kingdom of the good old days. Don't we expect the same as Peter? Don't we want a strong God who will overthrow our foes, like our conniving colleagues, our chronic illnesses, our stalled economy? Don't we want a powerful God, one who will restore our failing fortunes, who will fulfill our whims or protect us from tragedy? Don't we want a potent God who will lead us into a brighter and better future? Of course we do. But what we get isn't the Messiah we or Peter is looking for. Instead, we get Jesus, a paradoxical preacher who describes a kingdom reality where losers are blessed, where the poor are lifted up and the oppressed are given justice and those considered least in the eyes of the world are given the greatest honor. Our scriptures today challenge us to see the world through God's eyes and to rethink what we've considered about honor and power and blessing. And these stories of standing on holy ground, whether in the wilderness or in front of Jesus, these stories remind us that God is always present, making all of life holy. We are being called by Jesus who chooses the way of the cross, the way of self-giving love that, strangely enough, leads to a place of new life. And he leads the way by having his own heart broken on the cross, broken in love for us, broken in such ways that he knows our pandemic exhaustion, our fears for the present and the future, he carries our failures and our disappointments. And it takes this kind of love, one willing to bear the cross for our sake, to break open our hearts to become partners with Christ in loving and redeeming and blessing the world. This is how much Jesus loves us, that he was willing to lose his life for our sake that we might find abundant life. Let's pray. Holy God, give us new eyes to see one another as your children, precious to you, and renew our strength that we may respond to your call to solve difficult problems, to live creatively, joyfully, caring for one another and the earth you have given us. We give thanks that you are ever at work in us to conquer hate with love, to replace our fears with courage, and to defeat our death with your son's resurrection life. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.